Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Happy Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Today has felt like the longest week. I don't know. Is anyone else having that? In a good way. Just busy. So I read through the entire, this is Bailey with NCHV, I read through the entire SGA yesterday with my six different colors of pen to mark out the various sections of it. Um, so if any of your programs have any questions at all, uh, I think I'm going to eat, sleep, and breathe the SGA for the rest of the open grant period. Um, the first, uh, we always do training webinars on the grant solicitation. If you... I think we have all of you on that distribution list, but if for some reason you didn't get that announcement, um, I'll forward it to Ken so that he can send it out to you or just let me know. And um, my email address is up on the, the screen right now. But the training webinars, we do those for both new applicants and current grantees just so they can stay up to speed on any of the changes within the SGA and how it might um, impact the programs or if they're applying for additional funding. Um, with a new application, they can stay in the loop and know what's changed from previous years. The first one of those is tomorrow, and then we have one on Friday, and then one the following Monday, and then one the following Monday after that. So we should be able to get to everybody. We'll go ahead and get started in a minute, but I see we've got some folks on the line. Um, I see uh, Willis, are you on the line? Yes. Okay, great. And it looks like um, Janine? That's correct. All right. And I see Patty Sykes is on the line? Yeah. Patty? Okay, great. And Jay Evans? Yes, ma'am. All right. George, are you here? Yes, I am. All right. And what about Donna? I'm here. Hi, Donna. Hi. David, are you on the line? I'm here. Hi, David. Okay, great. I have, do I have both Chris's on the line? Chris from Alaska is here. Thank you, Chris from Alaska, for being up early for the call. Uh, Chris from Lansing is here, and hey, I got up pretty early today, too. I was up by 8 o'clock today. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> now that it's uh, getting light earlier, I feel guilty if I'm, you know, asleep past daylight, so 6.15-ish, and I'm wide awake. Um, all right, who else do we have? Uh, uh, Cece, are you on the line? I am. Thank okay. you. And... Uh, Anthony Sordini, are you on the line? Hi, uh, yes, I am. Tony, okay. And then we have the other Anthony. Is it Alisea? Yes. Okay, I didn't butcher that? Nope. And one of you goes by Tony, or both? I I go by Tony. Okay. Do, did I miss anyone? That's what everyone I have logged in yeah. on the webinar portion. Uh, Can't turn around hi, this is Bridget from Alaska. I'm sorry, who else from Alaska is on? This is Sandy Swartz from South Carolina. Okay. I'm trying to log into the webinar, but I'm having a little difficulty. Hi, this is Marla Milligan from San Diego. I know we've got two other folks on from Alaska and from San Diego, but I didn't catch names. 
Marla Milligan in Bridget. San Diego? Okay. Marla this and Bridget. This is Bridget from Hawaii, yeah. Hi, Bridget. Thanks again for you get the award for waking up the super earliest. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Hey, uh, uh, Bailey Skin, I'd like to make a, say a few words before you get started. Go right ahead. Uh, as you all may know, uh, Dana Bourne has accepted another position. And uh, <clears throat> I sent a, uh, a message to him this morning, and I got his, his outbox uh, email uh, outbox saying he, he's on leave until May 4th. Uh, and I think he's going to come back, uh, do a few things, and I think he's, he's going to leave our agency. Well, I know, I know he's going to leave the agency. So that, uh, and to my knowledge, um, Dennis Viola will be the acting uh, Boston Regional Administrator. Am I correct for those of you guys in the Boston region? Yes. Am I right about that? That is a correct uh, correct statement. And, and Ken, um, Dana comes back on the 4th of May, and I believe he starts his new position with, um, I forgot who it is, but I believe he starts on the 11th. Right, right. That said, um, I just found out from my boss, I believe it was a day or two ago, that I will be the acting uh, CGET lead or the leadership for the CGET committee until further notice. Um, I'm not going to make any changes uh, for this year. Um, we're going to carry on as if, uh, you know, leadership was, has been uninterrupted. Uh, the composition of the, of the grant review teams will stay the same, um, and we're going to go on as as is. Okay. Uh, there will be no CGET meeting today. I looked on the calendar, and there was a scheduled CGET, CGET meeting. Now, this is the meeting. Uh, this will be the training uh, now at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time and 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Any questions for me? All right. Can you repeat your name again? My name? Can you repeat your name again? My name is Kenneth Fenner, Everson Frank, E-N-N-E-R. I'm that, that, that annoying guy that keeps sending out messages from time to time. I'm not the only one. <laughs> I was going to say, this is Bailey. I thought that was me that did that. That's usually my intro. <laughs> Who was that that didn't know me? <laughs> <laughs> Kim Fenner is uh, the, the DOL vets guru, um, at least uh, that we work with, uh, the competitive grants lead here at um, in Washington, D.C. So any question, really anything about HVRP, Ken's the, the guru. Oh, and, and let me say this. You may have noticed that the Federal Register, Federal Register notice, I haven't seen the Federal Register notice, but the, the SGA has been posted at grants.gov for, for 2015. We are prohibited from engaging anybody uh, related to this, uh, this announcement or this procurement until after the, the actual announcement of awardees and the grant officer sends her notices of award out. So uh, please advise the folks in the regions to forward anybody who asks any questions to the grant officer. It actually says that in the SGA. Uh, they can engage the National Veterans, uh, uh, National, National Coalition for Homeless Veterans and Advocates for Human Potential, uh, but they, we, we are prohibited from engaging them. Okay? All righty. That's all I have. Oh, just a quick word on our process for that. This is Bailey with NCHV. Uh, the way that we handle that um, – on the TA side, during the open grant period, we have a very rigorous process we go through just to ensure that no applicants would get competitive advantage. Um, any conversation that we have with anybody, including current grantees, about the HVRP program, um, if it could any way be related to the open grant notice to the SGA um, or any of the associated documents for the SGA, we document all of those conversations and any questions that come up from programs to us, whether it's through email, phone call, um, on the webinars that we're going to give over the next couple of days, we pull all of those questions together, answer them, um, send them over to Cassandra, the grant officer, uh, for review, and then post those up for everyone to access. And the webinars are open to everybody, so uh, and they're free, there are no costs associated with those. So we make sure that um, 
any questions that come in to us, uh, the answers to those questions are available to anyone. So there's no competitive advantage there. Um, we don't do, we try to withhold on doing on-site TA uh, during the open grant period because, again, we don't want to, if any of those programs are finishing their fourth year or are applying for additional funds, we don't want to give um, any competitive advantage to any applicants. Um, we're, we're really stringent on that because we want to make sure that, you know, it's a fair process as possible and that we help that as much as we can. So um, you can feel free to send folks that have common questions over to us. We answer several hundred of them um, in the 30-day open grant period. It's always a lot of fun. Does anyone have questions about our process or any of that? And we have a dedicated email address set up for that. It's hvrp at nchv.org, um, and they can email us. And I thought um, we've got a couple more folks that came on the line. Um, I wrote down that you're here. So we, we got you, uh, Christy, Marla, Sandra, and Rebecca Starr. Are you on the line too with AHP? Okay, well. Yes, I uh, just joined. Okay, great. Welcome. Well, so we will be um, – as brief as possible this morning because this afternoon's presentation is kind of a heavy haul. Uh, today we're going to go over organizational capability and capacity in the morning block. And then in our afternoon block we're going to go over linkages, which as I mentioned, um, there are a lot of different elements to that. The uh, organizational capacity piece I think is a little bit more straightforward. Um, again, as with the first round of these calls, jump in, ask questions. Please, you know, engage, share your experiences. I know that there are a lot of folks that have been involved in this process several times. We went back through and updated the information for the webinars based on the new SGA that just came out. Um, if I missed, I don't think I missed anything in the updating process um, yesterday, but it got a little late doing those updates, so if I missed anything, please do let me know. Uh, as you'll see on the side on your screen, uh, this is just a review of the overall scoring rubric. You'll see that the organizational capacity and experience section, which is what we're going to talk about today, is worth up to 15 points out of a total of 100 points in this year's scoring rubric. I want to thank uh, Ken and the team for, for including that scoring rubric. We always get questions on it, and that's a really useful resource for people that will include uh, in the trainings we sent out. On slide four and five, you'll see what's actually in the SGA. I'm not going to read through this, but you'll just see what pieces are included in the SGA as it relates to organizational capacity and experience. So if you you know are wondering, well, what all do we need to include in there? And we'll go over this last piece um, at the end of today's presentation, presentation, which is how do you look at the applications that come in, whether they're HVRP, currently HVRP grantees, or whether they have HVRP experience, whether they don't have any HVRP experience, and how do you assess uh, whether they are showcasing that strong past performance, that organizational capacity and ability. You can think of the organizational capacity section as having two layers. The first piece is their staff. So composition of the staff members. And we'll talk about what you want to look for there, what might be some of the warning signs of a, of a weaker application, but also the organization as a whole. So what is the organization doing? What does their experience show that uh, leads them to not only have a coherent and complete application, but also a strong record of service where you can feel assured that they will do a strong job as an HVRP grantee? Now, the organization layer, you can unpack that even more into the four dynamics that you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, the administrative, operational, programmatic, and financial. Uh, and we included a couple of pieces on each one of those layers, uh, and those four dynamics are straight from, straight from the SGA. On your staff experience, when you're looking at that piece of the organizational capacity. What are some of the pieces that you might look for? Um, in the past, we've talked about the importance of there being veterans that are included on staff or formerly homeless persons on staff. That should be balanced with the organization having people on staff who have credentials working in the field. Maybe they have um, a, a master's in social work. Maybe they're a certified rehabilitation counselor. Um, be, be conscious of those credentials 
um, and the experience that the staff members have. But it can go deeper than that. You might have an organization that applies for funds that has no veterans on staff and no formerly homeless persons on staff, but you see that all of their proposed case managers have been with the organization for 15 years. Uh, their outreach worker has done outreach into the homeless population for the last 15 years. Their job developer has worked with employers that are veteran friendly for the last 10 years. Those are some strengths that you might see based on their length of service within the organization. Something else that we often um, may miss or not highlight when we're looking at the staff experience as it's outlined in the application is what kind of administrative support do they have? So it's great if the organization is proposing to have a job developer and a case manager, but if they don't propose anyone who has any experience with recording and reporting, who's going to be doing VOPAR? Who's going to be filling out their TPRs and TPNs? You want to see that staff time accounted for within their application. Otherwise, that might be a red flag for you to look at. Another challenge that you might see in applications, and I just want to bring this to your attention, is shared staffing. Now, some programs will divide up their staff between, say, an HVRP grant and an SSVF grant. And in their proposal, they'll offer four case managers, 25% of their time uh, devoted to HVRP. The other 75% of their time is devoted to SSVF. And this is just an example. You might think, that's a really great way for them to divide it up because they're ensuring that the two programs are coordinating. I'd ask you to please look closely in how they outline the way those staff members work to ensure that there's clear division of responsibility between those divided tasks and that they have a clear way of documenting how they're spending time within each one of those tasks. Maybe they have a daily timesheet that someone fills out showing that they spend a certain number of hours on HVRP and a certain number on SSVF. The reason I bring that piece up is we've seen with some programs that have struggled to integrate those two grants in particular or integrate services uh, for veterans using those two grants within their organization is when a veteran comes in the door who's homeless, his or her first priority is probably housing. If that person only has one case manager, every time he meets with this case manager, he's probably going to want to talk about housing. And they found that employment sometimes takes a back seat because when the veteran meets with that person, housing is their first priority. If the organization is able, it's stronger to propose that they have one person devoted to case management full-time for HVRP, and they have other staff members whose sole job is to focus on a different program like SSVF. The exception to that might be in some of your rural grantee applications, because they're probably proposing that um, they maybe have one, maybe two staff members that are engaged in their HVRP program, their application and their funding request is a little bit smaller. Uh, so they might not be able to cover a full-time person just with HVRP, so they do divide up that time. It's also functional. If they're working in a rural area and they're tra traveling long distances to meet with veterans, they might spend, say, an entire day going out to the VA Medical Center, which is two hours away. At that point, they'll have their meetings for HVRP, but they'll also recertify the veterans for SSVF. As long as they're showing how they're clearly dividing that time, that's a good use of the individual's time that divides up the programs. Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions on the division and staff experience? That's something that's come up often um, for programs that have had challenges recently, so I just wanted to bring it to your attention. But, Bailey, wouldn't that um, increase capacity? I mean, if they can share staff, particularly with the smaller organizations, if they can do shared staffing, that would be something we, we would look favorably upon, right? Right. So it, you're looking at the overall size of the organization <clears throat> and um, their overall capacity. If they have, say, just as an example, they are in San Francisco, and this would be one of um, four HVRP grants that they would have that program doesn't exist, but they might. Um, if in their application for $300,000, they're proposing that all six of their case managers are half-time, that might be a red flag for you 
because then they're not making it very clear that there are employment staff who are involved. But as Ken mentioned, if you have a smaller grant um, and they are maybe in a rural area and they are doing that shared staffing, that's a different case and that would be a strength in that point. Thank you. Let's go over the major dynamics. I mentioned in the beginning that there are four, starting with administrative management. So moving a step higher away from the staff level, how does the organization manage their team? Um, you want to look at things like, again, what's the work experience of the people they've hired? But even more so, what's their strategy for bringing people on board? Do they include job descriptions or discuss how they might want to do outreach? Do they discuss what kind of credentials that they're looking for? You also want to see within the organization structure itself, is there the commitment to this effort? Do they have a demonstrated record of serving veterans who are homeless? Do they have a demonstrated record of connecting veterans or people who are homeless to jobs? Uh, if the organization's mission is so far divorced from that that it's difficult to see the connection, that may be a red flag for you. Do they talk about their board and their involvement and what kind of uh, work they've done in the past to move forward veterans' employment and serving veterans who are homeless? Those are pieces to definitely look for when you're assessing their administrative management. One of the pieces that they need to include that they must have in their application is an organizational chart. And this will show you, that'll give you an idea of the size of the organization. So if they have four members of the staff included in their organizational chart, you'll know that, well, this is probably a smaller organization. So HVRP would play a huge role in their overall portfolio of services. But if you get that organizational chart and their HVRP program is stuffed underneath, or their proposed HVRP program is stuffed underneath this gigantic tree of services, um, and you don't really see employment or services for veterans with disabilities, veterans who are homeless, individuals who are homeless represented anywhere else in that organizational chart, you might want to consider what kind of role they're really envisioning HVRP playing within their organization. So moving on from the, operate, or from the administrative side, what does their operations look like? This will give you a chance for, uh, to assess what their startup history is like. So what kind of experience do they have engaging in smart startup? And we'll, start, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail at the end, so I'll hold off on that now. Um, but a few pieces that they must have within their, or within their application and also pieces that they should have to show how the organization manages itself um, would be, the, again, their organizational chart. You can see what the process is like for supervising staff, where the administrative staff who might be in charge of the reporting requirements fall in relation to the HVRP field level staff. You also want to see operationally, how do they work through their partnerships? When they include that local area network of service providers matrix, and again, that's a should have, it's not a must have in there, but you would, you would hope that they outlight that in, um, in some extreme detail. Uh, you can look to that list to see what exactly did their partnerships look like. And as an organization, where are those connection points between their external partners and their internal organization? You also have the opportunity to look at their experience doing monitoring of their own activities. They might have had similar grants in the past to do employment services, but did they set out clear goals, track against those goals, and then report back on the results that they had? You're also going to look at their planned goal sheet. Do the goals look reasonable? Do they have something like, we're proposing 100% entered employment? Maybe that's feasible for them, given that area, but you want to take a look at those pieces and say, well, does, is it really realistic that they can achieve these goals? Do they have the experience doing that monitoring within their organization? Do they have people who have expertise in doing that monitoring? And again, this is really dependent on the size of the organization when you look at that org chart. If you've got an organization with 400 people on staff and two or three HVRP grants, they might have someone who just does all of their, um, all of their reporting and all of their grant writing. But your smaller organizations, your four to five to 20 people organizations, 
everyone's probably doing a little bit of both. So they might have a 10, 15, 20% of an admin person who is devoted to uh, filling out their TPRs and TPNs and inputting everything into VOPAR. Now here's a big chunk of what you're assessing when you're looking at their organizational capacity, and this is their programmatic management. I mentioned earlier that you want to look for evidence of other grant awards. Uh, in the experience that you have, are there grants that stand out for you um, on the employment and training grant side that you want to look for? I can give some examples, but is there anything that you've seen when you're looking at applications? No? Nothing? Okay, well, I can give some examples. I hope everybody is awake. Um, well, you do want to be sure that when they give that list of other grants that they include a few pieces, like contact information for the grant officers, if they just sort of list, well, we did employment services for the city, uh, that doesn't really give you enough information to show that they really have that attention to detail that you might need for a program to be successful in monitoring um, their HVRP program. Again, you want to check out their implementation history. Um, so do they have a system proposed where they're actually going to be able to monitor what they're doing um, with HVRP to meet the goals they set out in their plan goals chart? A must-have is including their competitive uh, grant plan goals chart. If they don't include that, uh, they're missing a very significant piece of what they need to have for their application. Uh, an important piece that was added to this SGA, I don't know if you all saw it, but the applicants know that they need to include this information more than ever. It's actually outlined in the SGA that if you, whether you have HVRP experience or not, if you talk about past performance, administering, or managing grants, you need to submit information documenting that you have that history. Uh, the grant review team, as you'll see right here, and this is straight from the SGA, the grant review team does not have access to any of that information that would be inputted into systems during the evaluation process, so they have to include it. It's very clearly there in the SGA, there's really no excuse to uh, not include any documented history of what they've done if they're talking about the other grants that they use and how they've been able to implement them. The financial management side. Now this is the last of the four dynamics when you're looking at the organizational structure. Uh, the financial management side includes, includes a couple of key pieces. You want to make sure that they include that summary of their recent audit. Uh, you also want to look for that evidence that they use GAP. Um, and we can go into, uh, Ken, I'm not sure how that will be um, assessed when folks are doing that grant review. Do you have any guidance on how they can look for that ev evidence that they're using generally accepted accounting principles, or is it sufficient for them just to say that they are? To be honest with you, I've gone back and forth on this for, for a couple of years now. Uh, uh, and there are real advocates in the field right now for us to start doing a full evaluation of the cost proposal. Uh, and, and generally, you know, which would lead to, lead to what you're saying, you know, an, an analysis of whether or not they're using generally accounting uh, accepted accounting principles. Uh, but I'm kind of leaning with the folks in the past that have said that the grant review is really not the tool to be used to evaluate that section of the proposal. And there are no points associated with uh, with the budget. Um... No, yeah, yeah. They would like to see. They're they're really strong advocates. Would like to see us actually assign points and grade cost proposals. That's really in the vein of field oversight and not grant review. Yeah, and the only thing, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the only thing I would be on the lookout for um, in the application process in this section in particular would be if um, an HVRP program proposes to provide to a subcontract maybe $30,000 of their HVRP to a training provider, and that training provider is owned by the organization um, head or by the HVRP lead. You know, so they're essentially subcontracting to themselves um, 
I don't know if that's something to to be on the lookout for. I've heard of that in the past, and that can be it can be done right, but it can be a little a little sketchy depending on uh, how that's set up. That's not in the vein of the grant review. That falls in the vein of federal oversight, which would be conducted at the field level. All right, so we'll just leave that out. They'll probably, knowing the applications and knowing the applicants, they will probably just write that we use generally accepted accounting principles in their application and call it a day. Um, but a couple things to, that you can look out for uh, that would be important if they're proposing to pay participant wages in any way, it's very clearly outlined in the SGA um, how they can utilize OJT, and OJT cannot or uh, grant funds cannot be used to pay participant wages. It can't use, cannot be used to pay participant stipends or salaries. Um, so they need to find other sources of funds if they're going to uh, supplement any of those on-the-job training expenses. They are allowed to pay for the reasonable cost of training, um, but again, that can't be used to pay participant wages. So you can look out for that piece. Um, another piece that you might want to look out for is if they're proposing uh, repayment of any pre-award costs that they incurred, anything having to do with setting up their facility, um, staff that they hired before they're actually awarded the grant, those pieces, because they cannot include any pre-award costs in their budget. Hey, Bailey? Yes. Excuse me for jumping in. <laughs> if we could see each other, I, we, we, would, we would have eye contact. We, <laughs> I wouldn't seem I know, like I was right? just jumping in. But we do really support OJT. Yes. If, it, if there's an OJT uh, arrangement, uh, and people often confuse this, and they say, well, if you're, if you're arranging OJT, you're helping them pay participant wages. No. The vendors or the, the folks that would provide the OJT expense the award for training cost. Okay? Um, but if they are paying, if the vendor is actually paying the employee, then they have to pay the employee a taxable wage. And they have to treat that employee just like any other employee. Um, the federal government is prohibited uh, uh, with subsidizing private employers. So we do not pay uh, the salaries and wages of their employees, because that would, and that would be in the effect, in the vein of of, of subsidizing a, a private employer. So we don't do that. Now, don't confuse this with what the VA does. The VA can actually pay uh, the salaries and wages, <laughs> okay, because they they have a different law that they operate under. But um, uh, uh, we don't pay salaries and wages. And this grant cannot be expensed for salaries and wages. It can be expensed for training cost. I know that that can be get kind of hairy at times. Yeah, that that piece I know often it confuses grantees sometimes too. We always just explain to them, well, are you are you proposing to pay for training costs? Or the entity that you're going to be paying, what do their expenses look like? And as long as it's not direct pass through for participant wages. It's a training cost. Um, an example that a, a lot of programs use would be like um, forklift driving training, where you have an agency that uh, provides training at cost to the program, to the HVRP program, for forklift training. Uh, the grantee pays for those training costs, and then there's a clear um, uh, train to hire process that's included in that. So as soon as the veterans finish the program, which is usually pretty short, they get a job with an employer um, who they already have been working on through this program. So the training is is on the job site. Um, sometimes it's paid for by the HVRP. Sometimes it's at no cost and the employer pays for it. It looks a little bit different. Um, but OJT is a huge aspect for, for a lot of programs, sometimes with cost and sometimes without. I hope I didn't just confuse you more. And I apologize for the background noise. I don't know if you all can hear it, but they're uh, chopping down a tree directly outside my window, so it's a little bit loud. So I apologize if that's really loud. They don't give us warning with those things. Um, so on the showing sustainability side, this is going to be really important for your applications um, when you're reviewing them. 
from the SGA, there are a couple pieces that are suggested, things like having that diverse funding base. And again, this is so varied depending on where the program is located. If they're in San Diego, there are a lot more resources for them to vary that funding base versus if they're in rural Kentucky where there really aren't a whole lot of uh, financial resources for them to bring to bear. So keep that in mind when you are looking at those applications that you want to base it um, based on what's available in the area. And when we talk about linkages later on today, we'll show some of the communities that have recently received high surges of uh, funding and resources and have the ability to really diversify that funding base. Uh, you also want to see that the organization is planning ahead to diversify their funding. So they, in the long term, would be able to survive without HVRP because of the relationships that they've been able to set up. But there are some pieces within the community in their community relationships that show you their longer term stability. So have they been in the community serving veterans who are homeless, serving veterans in general, connecting them to employment, serving people who are homeless, connecting them to employment, for a long period of time, and do they have a demonstrated record of success with that? Have they been in their same building for 20 years providing these services, which might show you that uh, they not only have a long-term lease, but that people know where they are, that they're in an epicenter within their community? Do they have a lease, or do they have space maybe in their community resource and referral center, like we talked about on Monday? Do they actually go and have a history of working closely with those access points for veterans who are homeless are likely to go. And again, what's the consistency with their staff? Do they have staff members who have been around for a long period of time involved in this work? Whether they've been with the organization or elsewhere, have the staff members who are involved shown dedication to ending veteran homelessness, to connecting veterans to employment? Those are pieces you can look at to show whether the organization really has that longer term stability and whether they're really thinking through that like they need to. Last piece I'll mention on lo location, and this is just more of a logistical piece. Uh, when you're looking on their organization chart, it should include all of the sites that are on their uh, project performance site location form. Uh, you also want, that will give you an opportunity to assess whether the project really is urban or non-urban. Um, some applicants have tried to be kind of Sneaky with urban, non-urban designation in the past, um, we always refer them back to what the SGA says about deciding whether you would qualify as a non-urban program, um, but you do want to make sure that those pieces are consistent. So if they listed you know, three locations in their project performance site, you want to see that that's reflected in their organizational chart and in the work that they're discussing within their application. Startup is a key challenge, and I wanted us to take a little bit of time to talk about that. Um, has anyone had experience with the program that's had really intense uh, startup challenges or startup success that they want to share? I think the best way to rephrase that question is who hasn't had a grantee that has started up and was able to succeed? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Because I, I would, I this is Tony up at uh, up at, up in New York. I, I would tell you, uh, th there's been significant challenges as far as grantees that are starting off and, and are new to HVRP, and and getting them off on the right track. Um, I mean, the, the the laundry list of of challenges. I mean, everything. I mean, anything and everything happens. It seems like with, with new grantees. So, I mean, it's. One uh, one of the major problems I, I've noticed here in the last couple of years is uh, getting staff on board. Uh, by the time they get staff on board, uh, receive some sort of training, whether it be a post awards training or whatever the case may be, they're already well into the first quarter and they have a month or a month and a half to, to actually perform, and, and it's too late. And sometimes those you know that delay in starting up. Uh, proves to be so hard or so difficult on the grantee that it takes them the rest of the year to try to make up for that month and a half, two months, or, or that first quarter. And, um, I, you know, that's, that, that's my take on, on, on the startup. Yeah, Tony, I, I agree with you there. What we've, we see often with programs, 
confirms what what you're saying. If they don't have that history with HVRP, it's really difficult for them to just hit the ground running. Um, I know that there's some um, preference given for organizations that have a solid HVRP history just to, you know, reconfirm that those programs that have been doing HVRP, maybe that are reapplying um, after they're wrapping up their final year as a new applicant, they have the staff there. They have, if they've got a good record, they have um, the expertise in place already, and they won't have to go through that battle of the first quarter. What we say when we're out in the field, especially with new programs, is the first quarter is oftentimes, oh, wait, what? We have funding? Uh, we need to hire people. Second quarter is, oh, no, we need to enroll everyone we find. Third quarter is, oh, shoot, we need to be sure we're getting veterans' jobs. And the last quarter is, well, are we going to make it? Uh, it's a little bit of chaos. I hope we get reawarded second-year funding. Um, that's for programs that don't have an HVRP history. Oftentimes, that's kind of the process that they go through. We've seen it over and over and over again. Uh, so do be conscious of that and looking up how they, how they talk about startup. You have organizations that, um, you know, maybe applied for SSVF funding. They have a full-time grant writer for, you know, for applying for large federal grants, and they can write a beautiful application, but if they don't have staff in place, if they don't have a clear plan for bringing candidates on very, very quickly, not within a month and a half, but within the first couple of weeks, um, they're going to have some real challenges in performing within HVRP. Uh, just to reiterate what Tony said, I think, yeah, that's definitely spot on. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add on the startup? challenges or other things to look for? Um, yeah, this is Sandy in South Carolina. <clears throat> We've had I had a grantee once that um, their grant was written by a grant writer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Worked, worked partially on commission, so um, he overinflated everything, and I really felt bad for this grantee, but they there wasn't any way they could reach any of those goals. Um, and we eventually, they, they never got beyond the second year of their grant. We eventually shut them down. Um, but, you know, those are things that, um, you know, it's hard to tell when you're, when you're looking at these applications um, whether or not the grantee, can, the applicant act can actually accomplish these goals. I mean, it's obvious if they say they're going to enroll 100, um, assess 100, enroll 100, and employ 100, yeah, that's not reasonable. But... Um, you know, other situations, uh, you know, the, the, some of these grant writers can really um, over-exaggerate or embellish. So there's no way to, to, to figure that out until you actually start working with the grantee. Yeah, that's your uh, – great, Sandy. It's, it's hard to assess unless it's something as, as clear-cut as, you know, 100, 100, 100, especially when they're talking about placing 100 veterans in – um, employment, you know, and 100% on the retention side. Um, that's going to put up gr red flags. And you do have some programs that have very solid grant writers. Um, that's why these are little pieces to look for. Uh, a, a, pay, a paid grant writer who doesn't really know HVRP but knows good grant writing might not realize how important it's going to be to talk about startup. Um, and about getting that off the ground quickly because they're focused on talking about all the great relationships they have in the community. So this is an opportunity if they really don't talk about their readiness of their team um, or their engagement with, with the community and how they could just really get started day one. If they just say, we're ready to go day one, um, you do see some weakness in that application. Yeah, and yeah. this is Ken. Um, this is very good discussion. And, and kudos to you, Bailey, for 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 really articulating this and, and bringing this to to our attention. When I get a chance to talk about the grading criteria, I'm going to really look for or ask you to give high grades to organizations that have experience. And the reason that is is for the reasons that you're all mentioning is that we shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel here <laughs> and come up with a too many. You know, it, a whole lot of innovation at this point. We've been doing this for years, and the organizations that are successful have been doing this for years. And we're, we're, dealing, we're talking about people's lives here. And so they shouldn't have to learn for two or three quarters before they succeed. 
No, they should be ready to go day one. We say it in the SGA unequivocally. Day one, you should be ready to go because we expect you to reintegrate these homeless veterans in the quickest manner possible into the best jobs possible. So that said, you know, it's really critical that the tenured staff on these grant review teams that are in this line of work utilize your experience to advise the other folks uh, looking at these applications and say, hey, look, you know, we do we do think this organization is going to be successful day one, or this organization is most most likely is not going to be successful day one. That's just yeah. my input. No, I agree. And we'll, when we talk about linkages this afternoon, also, I think that there's a good opportunity to keep that part of the discussion going because there's um, there there are nuances in these applications. Um, you know, people can basically copy and paste what's in the SGA, but how do they demonstrate that they're a community leader? How do they demonstrate that they have solid relationships with partners, that they have a history of working with employers instead of just saying it? So we'll try to unpack that uh, on the linkages side a little bit this afternoon. Um, there's a lot to go over in that piece, so you know I put more in the slides than we'll actually go over. But I think the startup piece is really important because, like Ken said, you know this is not a petri dish. There are uh, so many solid applications and there's such high need for HVRP that um, the ones who get these awards need to do it right. Um, we're at, at NCHV, we're pretty, you know, pretty picky about that. Like if you're a grantee and you're not cutting it, we would rather that money um, be somewhere else because we're seeing this bigger picture where you have surges of funding going into all these communities, and HVRP is a limited resource, so it needs to be used effectively so that we can continue making the case for how well that program is serving veterans who are homeless and helping them not just, uh, you know, quickly move into a house, but helping them have a sense of identity, helping them have stability through the role of employment and income is very important. I, can, can I jump in here? This is Tony again up at uh, up, up in New York. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, you, you, we talk about past performance and, 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 and stuff like that. I, I believe off the top of my head, and I don't quote me on this, and, and I don't know what the new grading scheme is going to look like, but I believe last year past performance was only three points. And in the grand scheme of maneuvers, you can and, – and I have an example. I'm not going to mention any names, but I had a grantee that was, was a very uh, – you know, didn't meet their end of the bargain as what they proposed in their application – and they were a very poor performer, they submit a new application, and they got refunded um, for, for an, an additional three years. Uh, and, and when you take a look back and you say, okay, you know what, this person failed miserably, or this grantee failed miserably uh, in the past, and we just refunded them for an additional three years, and here we are in year one, and they're still failing. Um, so I mean, on my end of the bar, on on my end as the grant overseer, I'm I'm doing my part to provide them correct, um, you know, technical assistance, and we've placed them on a cap. But I don't think there's enough emphasis on this grading thing, uh, uh, on the grading scheme, on, on past performance, um, and I, I really think that's something that that needs to be addressed wherever that needs to be addressed. I don't know if that's at your level, Ken, or if that's with the grant officer, Cassandra Mitchell, and her staff, or or where, but. Uh, you know, past performance, and, and Sandy, folks, jump on in. If, maybe I'm the only person, and I'll keep quiet, but I, I don't think there's enough of a hard look at past performance when we're doing this uh, review. Well, I can't, uh, I can't really discuss the grading criteria in too much of a detail because uh, uh, NCHV is a non nonprofit. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say uh, earbuds. Um, <laughs> Can't really go there, but certainly that's that. You know, when we when we're actually going over the the grading criteria itself, uh, you certainly willing to make that point. It may be it. We may have opportunity to actually change the the grading scheme, uh, but it's it's getting kind of late in the game. I did send the the grading tool out to Dana, and I think Dana distributed it to the team leads for comment. But let's keep going. Uh, how much time do we have left? Uh, it's it's twelve forty six now. So, did we set up for forty five or fifty minutes? 45, I'm not sure. Right? Okay, 
Well, we'll say 40. How about 47 minutes? Because this is the last slide. Okay. Um, just a quick note on uh, the past performance piece, what, what I can talk about. Um, and that's the difference between what, what you want to see for applicants that have HVRP or have had it. Um, it's pretty clearly outlined in the SGA tangibly what they need to include. These four pieces that you see on slide 15, uh, the fourth quarter TPR, fourth quarter TPN, the plan goals for that specific TPR, and then if they have other grants that are comparable, the most recent uh, financial and technical performance reports uh, for the last year. A change for applicants that have not operated an HVRP grant before, uh, it's still the same pieces that you might have looked at before, but it's for the last year. So they need to submit that cumulative data for an entire year of relevant uh, program experience. In both cases, they have to be showcasing the work that they did against very specific outcome targets. Um, HVRP, those are ones that we're very familiar with, and I think that speaks to Tony's point. I'm sure you'll talk about in the grading criteria uh, at, a, at a later date. Um, not only do they have experience with HVRP, but how did they perform with that HVRP? You should be looking for something similar for applicants that have not operated HVRP grants before. Maybe they had um, a similar or comparable grant, but looking at that one year of performance, did they actually execute that grant well? Uh, did they perform well against the targets that they set out? And were those targets clear, or you know, does it sound like they kind of just made them up to go with what's required for the SGA? Um, those are the last pieces that I had for this morning's part. Again, we'll go into a lot on, on the linkages piece. Um, does anyone have questions before we go? Again, here's my contact information. Uh, just a quick note again on the, the webinars. If Ken, I think it might have been before you got on the line. Um, I think I sent you the announcement of the webinar training calls. If anyone did not get that, um, Ken, I don't know if you can share that with the, with the group to send out to their programs. We sent it out to our whole network and have sent it around. I don't think we can even go that far because oh, okay. it's now in the vein of the grant officer, okay. and we 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 can't solicit, we can't inform, we can't answer any questions. We we're 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 out of it completely. Got it. Mm -hmm. So if if someone asks you a question, send them send them to Cassandra, um, and then she can let them know that they can be on on one of the webinars. But it's all out there. Know that those resources are available to people, so they're not. You know, they're not abandoned, and they can still reach out to us on the TA side. Uh, we just won't talk to them about the grant notice, or if we do any of the questions they ask us, we'll record that and, and post that up publicly. That's all I have for this morning's part. Very good, Bailey. Any questions for Bailey? Okay. See everyone at 1600. Right. Thank you. It's just